much, Dr. Hakeem. And hopefully we have Dr. Levy with us as well. We're going to ask some questions, get through as many as we can. Okay, so we're going to start uh, with you, Dr. Hakeem. Do you advise that children should be diagnosed if they show signs, or do you think diagnosing children is not a good idea? Yeah, so um, uh, as, a, um, as an adult clinician, uh, I don't see children to make the diagnosis, but you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking with my pediatric colleagues about this, and um, I think everybody would agree that if a child shows uh, signs of uh, hypermobile EDS and actually meets the current criteria, then they should be diagnosed with hypermobile EDS. Um, I think as I was uh, trying to demonstrate in my talk that unfortunately though a lot of those signs um, may not be present early on um, and may or may not develop in order to be able to lead to a diagnosis. So um, if not enough signs are present and the diagnosis isn't entirely clear, then I think it's absolutely right that the child should be treated for their health problems um, and that they should be continue to be monitored uh, as things can change. Uh, and so um, the diagnosis can change. Thank you. Question for Dr. Levy. Um, there was a mention in your presentation how a diagnosis is needed for insurance approval, um, but there's not a diagnostic code for hypermobile EDS. So even though there's a diagnosis, ha um, what should we do? And has a new code been created? Sure. I apologize for that phone ringing in the background. Hopefully it will stop momentarily. Um, <clears throat> first, I would say that <clears throat> A diagnosis is not always needed, but is often needed or required by somebody who holds power over you or your healthcare provider. Um, yes, we, we desperately need the World Health Organization to recognize HSD as its own condition and give it an ICD code. In the interim, however, there are codes in the ICD, at least in ICD-10, and I suspect they're present in 11 as well for countries who use 11. There are codes that can be used and which I use routinely. There's one for simply joint hypermobility and there are codes for most if not all of the other common chronic conditions that patients with HSD and EDS are, are suffering from. So there are codes for POTS, there are codes for the various GI dysfunctions, there are codes for fibromyalgia, etc. So for now, even without an HSD code, there are still plenty of codes that can be used to actually, despite how sick you might feel, we could add enough diagnostic codes to make you look even sicker than you actually are if your insurance company really needs that. It's possible. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Hakeem, why do some who have had few symptoms suddenly have very disabling symptoms? Hmm. Um, can I just say in, in part of response to the last question that it's my understanding that for the um, uh, post-2020 with the development of the ICD-11 um, uh, um, cataloging of disease uh, that actually um, hypermobile EDS will be included. Um, uh, I, I, I believe that there's an expansion and extension of the codes for, uh, for EDS so we must look out for that and uh, when, when that's clear uh, I think um, you know we are in the society certainly can publish uh, what we know of those new codes. Um, uh, come back to uh, the question. So this is a this is a question about why somebody might suddenly develop symptoms. So um, I think the health history can be very different between different people, um, but this kind of sort of sudden or uh, rapid development of concerns is certainly something that that I, I recognise in my clinic. I'm sure my colleagues do. Uh, and I guess what I'm looking for um, is whether there's a related triggering event of some sort, um, uh, trying to identify, for example, if there's been a physical injury, which would be quite obvious uh, in the history. More subtly, maybe changes in the environment or changes in activities. Uh, I mean, rather apparently benign things like a you know, change in, the, in a work desk station or a chair, or maybe a reduction or indeed an increase or a different type of physical activity might be a clue that's triggered something. Um, so exploring those things in the history, um, adolescent growth uh, and puberty may be an issue. Uh, pregnancy can be uh, uh, a point in time uh, as a trigger. Um, and I think with, as we see with lots of other musculoskeletal conditions, when the body is under stress for some reason, 
Uh, say, for example, following a significant infection, uh, when there's been new mental health concerns um, or uh, you know, situations that cause some kind of uh, physical stress that can be a trigger. So those are sort of some of the uh, things that I could think of that we would certainly explore in detail. But the truth is, is that in some situations, you dig really deep to try and find out why this has suddenly occurred. Uh, and you sit there and think, well, why this, why now? And you don't get an answer. Thank you. And Dr. Levy, is it possible that trauma might trigger worsening of symptoms that might have been mild and undiagnosed prior to the trauma? Yes, um, th this really follows right on what Alan was just talking about. Uh, we all see it, that it could be a traumatic event, it could be an infection, or any of a number of things that, that Alan just outlined. Um, I, I think we're both validating, yes, we see this. I suspect that behind the question, what is really on people's minds is why. Why do things get worse and fail to get back to the way they were before the event? And, and we don't know. It's a wonderful question that, that still needs more investigation. We don't know, but it happens. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Hakeem, are bone fractures more common in hypermobile EDS and HSD? Are they more common? Um, I'm wondering if the question is, are they more common than you see in the general population? Um, my understanding of the literature is that they are not more common than you would see in the general population. But um, we are beginning to understand that there are some uh, subvariants uh, that have an overlap with the condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, and uh, um, people may be aware that a couple of papers have been published more recently that have looked at hypermobile EDS with low bone density and a history of um, fractures uh, in childhood, but not necessarily in adulthood. Um, and that this is associated with a gene variant in COL1A1. So there's definitely some sort of overlap uh, in a uh, small uh, proportion of people with hypermobile EDS with, um, with con conditions like osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, but in general, uh, the risk of fractures per se in childhood or adulthood is no different from the general population. And we need to explore other reasons why that uh, was occurring if it was. Thank you. And Dr. Levy, if we fit the 2017 criteria well and are diagnosed with heads, but still have features of other types, should we have genetic testing to rule out those rarer types? As the cost of genetic testing comes down, and it is not coming down equally around the world, so we clearly have issues of access, which are not equal across the globe. <clears throat> but as the cost comes down, it becomes more feasible to get genetic testing. So in my mind, the threshold for when to order a test to get rid of that Hitchcock effect, to remove your fear of something more serious, the threshold to order that testing is definitely getting lower. But um, I wasn't able to attend um, the talk yesterday about understanding genetic testing. Hopefully a lot of the audience did, or I encourage you to go back and watch that talk. I'm pretty sure that it reviewed some of the uncertainties that can come with genetic testing. So especially in genetic testing, the answer you get back is not always normal or abnormal. There's an in-between zone where a genetic sequence can vary or differ from the reference. And we don't know enough about the genome yet to always answer the question, is this variation normal or pathologic or somewhere in between? So from a cost perspective, yes, it's becoming easier and makes more sense to order testing if you think there might be a rare type of EDS or some other genetic diagnosis. But it's also important before you get tested to think about your tolerance for uncertainty. If you get back a result that says there's a variant in a gene that may or may not be abnormal, make sure you're psychologically prepared for that uncertainty before you get that test done because you can't unknow it once you know it. Thank you. And Dr. Hakeem, why does the Baton score test the joints that it does and not others? Right, uh, so well, we'd have to go back historically to um, look at the literature and takes us right back um, 30 years. Um, so um, comparisons were made between this particular tool and previous tools that looked at many, many more joints. 
Uh, and the study essentially showed that if you look at these five regions of the body, they give you just as much likelihood of generalized joint hypermobility being present as if you uh, actually looked at um, all of uh, the joints um, in previous criteria. Now, I think the thing is, is that in clinical practice, this is actually, uh, in truth, a bit of a problem. And we are uh, exploring this and trying to understand this more in our work around the criteria. And the, the problem as I see it, and, and, and I believe I'm speaking for others that have discussed this uh, in, in detail, um, uh, is that if the Bateman score is positive, in other words, for uh, an adult um, uh, five or, or more out of nine, that's fine. It means that you can be considered to have generalized joint hypermobility. But in clinical practice, if the Bighton score is less than five, i.e. negative, what one really needs to do is go and have a look at all of the other joints um, uh, that might be um, affected uh, in an individual's, and in particular the neck, shoulders, um, uh, hips, ankles, small joints of the hands and feet in more detail. Um, so a positive score is great, it puts you in the hypermobile camp, a negative score doesn't exclude it in clinical practice. And so we're beginning to re-explore um, whether we need to do sort of uh, something along the lines of Biton Plus. Thank you. And the last question uh, to Dr. Levy, is HSD genetic? <laughs> uh, let's start by defining the word genetic. I Usually when people ask me is fill in the blank genetic, they really are asking, I think, is there a, a, an error or mistake in a single gene that causes the condition? But with full disclosure that I'm biased and I think like a geneticist, I believe very, very strongly that there are genetic components to everything. If we had more time, I would argue to you that getting hit by a truck is a genetic condition. It's mostly environmental, but there are genetic factors. So I want to answer this question on two levels. On the level of there being genetic contributions to virtually every health condition, yes, of course it's genetic. But in the context of the way I think the question was meant, is there a single gene that can be traced as being inherited in a dominant or recessive or X-linked pattern? The answer is remember that the S in HSD is spectrum. It is not a single condition. It is a collection of conditions that vary across what conditions we include in there, as well as over time in terms of symptomatology, as Alan pointed out in his talk. And because this is a diverse spectrum of conditions, we can't speak of it in the singular, it's in the plural. So coming to the ultimate answer, I think we will almost certainly find that many of the specific conditions that we are now grouping in HSD will turn out to be single gene disorders that may be inherited dominantly or recessively or in other described ways. But I think many of the others will turn out to be more of the multifactorial complex disease that have some genetic components and some environmental components. A lot left to be learned there. Thank you both so much. Okay, that wraps up that session. We're now gonna to move to a break where we're gonna hear from a community voice. Thank you so much, Dr. Hakeem, Dr. Levy, and we'll see everyone in five minutes. Thank you.